When you think about the most special day of the year, what comes to mind for you? Did you know that aside from the weekly Sabbath, God once defined the most holy day of the year? Stay tuned. In this episode of Harvest, we will discuss Yom Kippur and its significance to us today. Yom Kippur, or as we call it, the Day of Atonement, was the most special day in the liturgical cycle of ancient Israel. Let's read about it in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 33. And he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for the people of the assembly. All year long, the sins of the people had been symbolically transferred to the sanctuary through the blood of animal sacrifices. By mean of blood sacrifices, the sins of God's people contaminated the tabernacle. All year long, this sin-filled blood polluted the tabernacle. At Yom Kippur, these sins were cleaned out of the sanctuary some important symbolic acts occurred on that day. First, two goats were chosen. The first goat was offered as a sacrifice for all sin. No sins were confessed over this animal. His blood was used to clean. Let's read Leviticus chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and for all their sins, so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. The high priest brought this blood into the most holy place to atone for the uncleanliness of the people. Before the high priest could do this, there was a time for the congregation to think about their lives, to express to God that they were very sorry for their sins. It was a solemn Sabbath, so the people could not only confess their sins, but so that they could also stay in tune with God and not be drawn to their sins any longer. The high priest would then ask God to forgive the combined sins of the nation that had been transferred into the sanctuary. 
while the high priest interceded in the most holy place, the congregation fasted and prayed outside. Let's read Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Next is where the second goat came into play. This goat was known as the scapegoat. When the high priest came out of the sanctuary, he symbolically carried all of the sins that had been confessed during the past year of temple services. He went directly to the scapegoat and he symbolically transfers the sins to this animal. Laying both of his hands on the scapegoat, the high priest would confess the sins of the people and all their transgressions, and then the scapegoat was led out into the desert wilderness. Since the scapegoat bore the sins of the congregation, it was separated from the congregation because sin causes separation from God. Let's read Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. But your sins have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. God's purpose in the plan of salvation is to remove the separation between our hearts and his love. His ultimate plan is to restore us to communion with him. God longs for the day when we are not going to be separated anymore, and he can take us to live with him in heaven. He has been working towards this objective for the last 6,000 years. When Jesus Christ died for our sins in the year 31 AD, he put an end to the need for animal sacrifices because they symbolized his death. Jesus took on the consequences of our sin for us and allows us to be redeemed, should we choose. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 10. By that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Using our modern Gregorian calendar, we can read that on Friday, April 27, in the year 31 AD, type, which are the symbols that point to Jesus, met their antitype, Jesus the one true sacrifice who would forever answer the question of man's salvation. I want you to imagine the scene that occurred on that first Good Friday. An eerie twilight has enveloped the temple courtyard, leading to a three-hour unearthly darkness. It is now the time of the evening sacrifice. As the priest begins preparing to slay the innocent lamb, a violent earthquake strikes. Suddenly, a hand appears, ripping the curtain that separates the holy from the most holy place. The priest concentration is now broken. The most holy place of the earthly temple is no longer the only place that is holy. God has demonstrated that this place no longer will be used to point forward to the story of Jesus' sacrifice. At this same time, Jesus is hanging on the cross in excruciating agony, and he exclaims, It is finished, and he bows his head and he dies. As a witness to all of these events, the Roman centurion cries out, Truly, this man was the Son of God. In his death, the Redeemer fulfilled his mission. There was no longer a need to offer animal sacrifices as the event that they pointed our minds towards had now happened. Jesus, the Lamb of God, gave his life, his own blood, as the ultimate sacrifice. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus returns to heaven. But what is he doing there? Jesus, the Lamb of God, has another important role in our salvation. He now acts as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Let's read together Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. 
seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. If everything in the earthly sanctuary represents what actually occurs in heaven, then just as the earthly service had to have a year of daily atonement, or Yom Kippur, to clean the sin out of the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary also must be cleansed. Ecclesiastes 12.14 tells us that a record is kept of every person's life. These records are what are studied during the heavenly judgment. The prophet Daniel was shown the heavenly sanctuary and its cleansing in a vision given by God. During this vision, he saw an overview of future world events. He even overheard a discussion, and he recorded it in his book, Daniel, chapter 8. One holy person in the vision asks, How long is the vision going to be? And another one answers, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Through the study of this prophecy and using the Bible's year-to-day principle for prophetic time, Bible scholars found that this time period actually represents 2,300 years. Daniel 9 shares that the beginning of this prophecy would occur when the command went forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And history tells us that the command was given by King Artaxerxes of Persia in the autumn of 457 BC. Beginning at this date, and then counting forward 2,300 years, the end of the prophecy would be in the fall of 1844 AD. In the 1800s, a group of believers who traced these prophetic lines believed the earth was the sanctuary. They thought the cleansing of the sanctuary would be when Jesus came at his second coming. Just as the earthly sanctuary was cleansed on the Day of Atonement, they believed that Jesus was coming on the Day of Atonement in 1844 to cleanse the earth. Throughout the Bible, the Day of Atonement has always been celebrated on the seventh month of the tenth day of that month. We have to understand the Jewish calendar is not based on a solar calendar but on a lunar calendar, which is why the seventh month isn't July, like our month. The way we track days, weeks, months, and today, it would place the Day of Atonement in either September or October. In 1844, the Day of Atonement actually fell on October 22nd. It's both a historic and a prophetic timeline date. As this message was shared, Many sincere people started preparing for Jesus' return. They were called Advent believers because of their faith in Jesus' literal return. They worked to warn the world of its impending end. As the day of October 22, 1844 dawned, the hope of these Advent believers was palpable. Now imagine the deep disappointment they had when this glorious event didn't take place. However, through more prayer for divine light and Bible study, it was found that the Bible didn't teach that the earth was the sanctuary. The Bible clearly teaches God has a heavenly sanctuary. Remember, the Bible tells us the ancient Hebrew sanctuary was a copy of the original in heaven. Instead of returning to cleanse the earth on the Day of Atonement, God had begun the process in the most holy place. He began the work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. Just as animal sacrifices were a type of the anti-type, Jesus' sacrifice, the earthly day of atonement was a type, while the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is the anti-type. This cleansing would not only be completed in a single day like the earthly celebration of Yom Kippur, and it couldn't even be done in a single year. This cleansing is going to continue 
until sin is forever destroyed. The heavenly sanctuary is contaminated with the records of all of our sins. Jesus, as our high priest, has now entered the most holy place, God's throne room, to begin the cleaning process. His sinless life is enough to cover the sin of every person who has ever lived. However, there must be a time to investigate the heavenly record. Whose sin is needing to be covered? Who has made the decision to accept his gift of forgiveness? Who has committed their life to him? I want my life to be thoroughly committed in every way in thoughts, words, and actions and motives to Jesus Christ. I want all of my sins to be forgiven and I confess them each day to him privately. I accept Jesus as the only means of my salvation and eternal life, and I recognize that my life and my actions are nothing more than filthy rags. Any good works that I perform are because he has enabled me to do so. There's nothing that I bring on my own. In our next discussion, we will discuss what happens to the scapegoat. I believe. Do you believe? Thanks for watching. Please like and share, and don't forget to subscribe.